guys, welcome. Welcome back to Inner Stage Window, my Saturday show where we have a conversation between me and one of my friends. And today we have Brie with us. Say hi, Brie. Hello, everyone. Hey. Oh my gosh, I'm so excited to have you back, Brie. I, I love our Brie episodes, y'all. <laughs> I'm so excited. Thank you for having me back. Yay. Um, so Landon had something come up, so she couldn't be here today, but that's okay because we have Brie here and we're still going to get into some um, really fun, exciting stuff. So um, Brie, kind of before we get started and uh, and while I get the game going, would you like to explain to everybody what our topic is going to be for today? So we are going to be talking about keeping your RPs fun and fresh and exciting. We have some interesting topics to go through and help you you know, keep your role plays going so you don't feel like you're stuck in a rut. Yeah, uh, yeah, all kind of stuff like that. And um, before we really get into even, you know, favorite things and stuff, we're going to do another prediction. So hi, Katie. Um, I think you're the main person in the in the chat right now. We're going to do another prediction. I've got my garden set up for Elephanilla, which is the second to last pinata that we need to get before we're done with this game. And I got rid of everything else so that hopefully there's enough room and it'll all be good and it'll join up. But we're gonna do another prediction to see if I get one today. So we're really just gonna be watching this waiting for, for an Elephanilla to come. So let me switch back real quick to just the Twitch um, since that game will not let me have it up at the same time. We're gonna do a prediction. So see we're just gonna do will i get an elephanilla this time she or won't she <laughs> <laughs> and we're gonna do another 15 minutes so we're gonna go ahead and start the prediction and um you know last time this brought the luck and it just made arorio instantly uh come into the garden hey jane hey naomi oh my gosh everybody's here Bree. everybody's here to hang out with you oh nikki too welcome guys welcome <laughs> all right all right so prediction is up spend those points spend those channel points so that you can hopefully get some more channel points if you're right and uh and yeah we can actually like for real get started now so with that being said um let's do favorite things brie what's your favorite thing this week my favorite thing oh my god so the conjuring three um what is that called the preview for the movie came out yesterday oh I think it was. oh the trailer trailer that's it i don't know why that word evaded me but i'm so <laughs> excited about it it looks yeah. so good i've been waiting so long it was supposed to come out june of last year mm -hmm, mm -hmm. and so now they finally dropped the trailer and it's coming out june of this year i literally cannot wait yeah they had um didn't they have a lot of production issues because of the pandemic i know there was a lot of movies that had that but i feel like that was one of them right yeah it, yeah it did and then they um had like because they couldn't have people on set obviously and then i think one of the um workers had got covid so they just shut it down completely oh wow oh wow that's awful yeah. that's awful and you love those kind of movies right like you love those kind of like ghost spooky type of yeah. movies i i have been obsessed with these since 2013 when they came out and i love <laughs> who they're based on so i'm i'm thrilled i'm pumped <laughs> Because it's like semi true story, or at least the, the uh, investigating that house part. That's a true story, right? Yeah, like somebody all based actually on did true that. Stories. Yeah, yeah. Um, I've seen them. I, I'm not like huge into horror movies, though, so they don't really stick in in my mind. But um, I remember not hating them. So you know, <laughs> <laughs> so they must be pretty good. They must be pretty good. Um, yeah. What's what's uh, what's this third one supposed to be about? So it's um, I, it actually happened. I think it was back in the '80s. It's one of the biggest like court cases from that time, where the guy actually went to court and told them the devil made him do it. So they were actually like they didn't know how to charge him, and he oh. committed. A, I think it was a murder or something. Wow. Yeah. I mean, that sounds like. I mean, it's not really an insanity plea, but it kind of sounds like that, right? Yeah. So, that, yeah. That's, that's crazy. Yeah, that's what they're trying to do in it. But then you have the investigators who are like, no, like, you need to believe in this. You be you swear on the Bible in church. Why can't you believe in the devil? Mm. Oh, yeah. wow. Got him. <laughs> <laughs> Checkmate, atheists. <laughs> <laughs> 
Yeah. Uh, thank you for the posture check, Nikki. I, I'm sit. I'm sitting up. I'm gonna start. We're gonna start sitting up straight today. Um, <laughs> from the beginning of the stream. <laughs> I'll have to watch that when it comes out. Thing? Oh, my favorite thing. Okay, so I actually have two favorite things. So I had one prepared last night, but then today um my husband made some homemade bacon this is part of the reason why the stream started late y'all this is this was my excuse brie had a, her own excuse but i had my excuse too so he <laughs> uh as y'all know he has the smoker right so he um he made homemade bacon this morning and if you have never had homemade bacon y'all it is the best thing in the world you'll never buy store-bought bacon again if you have somebody like smoke bacon at home for you so he made some bacon this morning and we had a blt brunch it was delicious <laughs> sounds delicious so that's what's on my mind at the moment <laughs> <laughs> um but you know my actual favorite thing that i had prepared when i when i was thinking about this yesterday was um shadow and bone the tv show dropped and um, i never read the books or anything i know they're super crazy popular but we watched the first two episodes of the TV show last night. And y'all, it's really good. I really, really like it. <laughs> it's on Netflix, isn't it? Yeah, yeah, it's on Netflix. So the whole season is out. Now, I haven't seen more past the first two episodes, so don't spoiler me too much, y'all. But <laughs> um, we watched the first two episodes last night, and it's it's good. I really, really like it. Um, it the, there's basically like uh, two, different, two different stories going on in the show. There's like a plot line that's... Um, you know the main the main girl and the powers that she has and then there's this other plot line of like these rival um gangs in the main city um that's in the the world of this story so um in, in both storylines i thought were pretty captivating and cool and had neat characters and stuff so i'm excited to see where it goes i think it's gonna be pretty good for sure i i it's on my list i need to watch it Mm -hmm. I think Landon is obsessed with the books, and um, I know she was busy today, so she couldn't be here, but uh, but uh, we'll have to tell her afterwards <laughs> that we talked about this of the favorite things, because I think she's obsessed with those books. Um, and I assume the TV show is just the first season, it matches the first book, I assume. I don't really know. I have no idea how closely this follows the books, or if it's just like, you know, using the characters or what. But um, But I'm enjoying the TV show quite a lot so far. Hey, that's always a good thing to find a new TV show. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. And I feel like because of because of the pandemic and everything, um, you know, and so many places had to like halt production schedules and craziness like that, you know, like what happened with The Conjuring 3, um, you know, it's been we've done a lot of rewatches, but it's been hard to find new stuff that we really enjoyed this past year, you know? Yeah, it's I feel you. I've rewatched like six to 20 tv shows yeah that's what we've been doing like we rewatched parks and rec we re we rewatched psych um a couple of other things because like we just got to a point where it was like you know we would try a show and we get like maybe two episodes and we'd be like this actually is not that good <laughs> and there just wasn't yeah, enough to keep trying <laughs> yeah i watched Grey's or rewatched Grey's like three times and now i <laughs> it's a big yeah. tv show to rewatch yeah yeah that's a long one so lots of good good material there. <laughs> yeah. Yep. All right. So um, I guess at this point, let's get in. Let's get into the topic, right? Yeah. Um. So to give y'all a little bit of an introduction on some of this, some of this stuff that we're going to talk about today. Uh, Brie still currently and me previously role played on Tumblr, and so this first section of tips that we want to talk about comes a lot from um, the struggles on on there because I know and this and I know that a lot of people struggle with this stuff on discord like um, ghosting or people getting bored of RPs very quickly is like freaking rampant on Tumblr and w would you agree Brie like does that still kind of match your experience? <laughs> yeah it people will especially because they, there's no like reply time that you have on Tumblr people do what they want so like yep you get a few replies in and it's been like a month and a half and you're like okay now what? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and you don't know if they've ghosted or not. And on Tumblr, everybody's so kind of like that kind of fakey-ish 
polite mm. sort of that they'll tell you they didn't ghost when they totally did and they have no plans to reply you know <laughs> at least yeah, that was a lot of my experience <laughs> and you can see what everyone's doing so like you know but they won't admit it so it's <laughs> mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. yep i experienced that a lot on tumblr <laughs> so um so brie is a is a great guest for today's topic of keeping your rps fresh and exciting for the first piece that we're going to talk about especially since she is a tumblr role play veteran like and you have to like constantly keep it exciting to keep things moving at all there, right? <laughs> For sure, absolutely. Yes, so the first thing we really wanted to talk about is like keeping things loose. And Brie, I'll let you take this first. What are some of your like particular ones, whatever particular tip you wanna start with, with keeping things loose and kind of explain like what we mean by that? Um. So with keeping things loose, I think the very first thing I would say would be like, don't be afraid to pause something you can be writing something and you could even be invested in it but if you see it's not working don't be afraid to change it up that's the number one tip i don't there's a point where you have to force yourself to write things to get like through um maybe a pivotal plot moment but if you need to stop something stop it there are a plethora of opportunities to write different things and you should take them when they come Mm hmm. Mm hmm. I would agree with that. Like, I think at the end of the day, you know, some people get very into like their timeline and very into like, you know, oh, I started this, I have to finish it, stuff like that. And I feel like when we're talking about a hobby like role play, it is impossible to do by yourself <laughs> put it that way there is no such thing as role playing by yourself you have to have at least one other person that you have to you have to not be scared to be like hey this is boring or i can tell that my partner is bored with this and we need to, to stop trying to push ourselves to do this thing that's really boring you know um it's not like writing a solo story where you, you can just push through the boring parts on your own. If your partner's not replying to you, no amount of your own willpower is going to make that role play happen. You both have to have it. And sometimes the reality is that's just not what cards you were dealt. You know, it's just not going to happen either from you or from the other person. You know, you can still be replying and pushing through the boring part and they just aren't interested and aren't going to do it. Or maybe they are interested and they just, you know, they 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 think they're interested but on the inside they don't feel it you know <laughs> and it becomes like a whole thing <laughs> yeah so even pressing pause even if you go back to it later or you know what you can completely abandon it and that's okay because you're not you don't have to force yourself to do something that is generally not working like you probably wouldn't do that in real life so why are you forcing yourself to do that on a hobby that is supposed to be fun Right, exactly. Like, if you're not paying me, then why am I going to force myself to do something I don't want to do? <laughs> Wait, like, you know? <laughs> I'm here to have fun. Exactly, exactly. At the end of the day, well, we're all here to have fun. And I think we can feel it when we're not having fun anymore or when the other person's not having fun anymore. And so, like, it's totally okay to pause what's your role playing, pause your plot. And, um, you know, if you like this person and you like your right the writing style or you like the pairing then you can start a new one like just pausing this particular plot or this particular scene or whatever it doesn't mean like not role playing right it just means that you're not going to reply to this particular thread uh you can start a whole new plot maybe with different characters maybe with the same ones whatever um and that way you don't lose touch with that person you can continue to role play with that person uh, you know, I, I would do that a ton with people that uh, got bored easily on Tumblr. You know, we just start new, start new things and abandon the old ones. And um, I know Discord is more the more popular platform now, and it really doesn't have a way to do memes. But <laughs> memes were a great way to do that on Tumblr. Uh, and we would just start like all kinds of random stuff, you know, based on reblog memes that you would see on there. And um, And I haven't found like a good way to do this too well on discord but um just starting something just completely random like from a list of prompts sometimes is all all it takes to keep the writing going with that person and make it interesting for you guys again uh, I, definitely making use of like the things tumblr i guess is the main one for this but tumblr offers a lot of wonderful memes and like role play prompts that like you can use so take advantage of those when they come to you if you're not liking what you're doing and even as like an addition 
because sometimes having something on the side can help you realize like hey that thing that we are writing and we've been putting our time into it isn't working yeah yeah sometimes you don't really know why you're bored with something you don't know if it's the person or the characters um or the plot until you try another plot and see for sure yeah and so take advantage of those yep and I think kind of my one of my favorite ways to do this, and uh, Naomi, who's in the chat, will know this, is to make a gajillion alternate universes. <laughs> yes. Oh my god. <laughs> so we used to do this on Tumblr all the time. Like when we when I found somebody that I liked writing with, um, we would like maybe and it may be the same character. Like with me and Naomi, it was Elijah, right from the originals. You know, still love them. <laughs> yes. Oh but god, uh, I remember that. Yes, but it was Elijah, and we would have like three or four different um, Elijah AUs going all at the same time. And there was always like a favorite one, you know, there was always a favorite one. But if we were bored with that one for the moment, or we didn't have any good ideas for that one at the moment, we could easily hop over to one of the other ones, you know, and it didn't have to be a big deal. But because we we're still writing together, we were still maintaining that friendship, we were still maintaining that 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 ship itself. You know, and it didn't have to feel like that we were losing touch or that we were getting bored or that meant we had to stop role playing because there was always something else to do. There was another AU that like made it new and interesting because one of the wonderful things about AUs is because the setting is different. You end up having to change things about the characters, pers personality and backstory. Like I tend to change things very small things, you know, but there are things that end up changing, right? You just put them in a slightly different situation and they are a different person, just as we all would be if we had been born into different situations, you know? So AUs are fun in that way because it becomes, um, it becomes less predictable. I'll put it that way. When you've been role-playing with somebody for a long time, you know how that happens, right? It starts to become yes. predictable. You know how their character is, you know how they are, you know what they like, what they're probably gonna do. And, uh, and, and that can be a little bit boring, but AUs kind of ensure that that is not the case. Yeah. Yes, alternate. exactly, Mochi. <laughs> yes, they are so fun, Mochi. They're, I love exploring them, especially like you can even an alternate universe in the sense that like you could, if you have a fandom character, like um, a canon character, I mean, you can go ahead and throw them into someone else's canon timeline. Yes. To, like, a different fandom and that is always a great way to not only keep your rps fun and exciting but to then explore your character in a way that like you haven't seen them before because you're used to their canon timeline like for instance harry from harry potter and then throwing them into i don't know the hundred or something mm -hmm, they're gonna be mm -hmm. they're gonna be different people but they're still the same character and you can still keep core values while exploring different sides of them that otherwise you probably wouldn't have been able to explore yeah. Um, do you remember like um, back in the day when like um, the Vampire Diaries and the originals was really popular, people would have like these crossover of like Vampire Diaries universe, Supernatural universe, because, you know, they're both CW shows and then Teen Wolf. I know it was Teen Wolf was an MTV show, but whatever. It was the same kind of idea. Um, and people would put those three together and it was like it was like a much cooler Super Who lock. I'm just saying. <laughs> <laughs> yes, you, you unlock so many different things that like you didn't even realize before you did mm -hmm. it that you were missing out on. Yeah, because like, you could like mix the lore together and you could like make characters have relationships that they wouldn't have normally had and interactions they wouldn't have normally had. Yeah, it, I, I personally, that's one of my favorite things to do there. It's very rare where I will come, every thread I have will be like this character in their preferred canon timeline. Been there, done that, watched 35 to how many ever episodes of it i want something else yeah yeah and those are a really good way to do it or like i know a lot of people on tumblr will have like um what what you would call a fandom oc right so it's like it's their oc but like they typically belong in fandom whatever you know they're like a harry potter oc you know like you said with your harry potter example or whatever the situation is and um and if you've got that got like a, a quote unquote like fandom oc then I think it's always a good idea to write them as if they were a fandom OC in a bunch of different fandoms so that you have like a lot of choices to play with and a lot of different ways to go about things so that things don't get boring with that particular character. But I think that's another thing um, that can happen when you play lots of different characters like, you know, like I do and I like I know you do too. Uh, is you can have like certain characters that are your favorites, right? And certain other ones that you can be a little bit bored with. 
<laughs> for sure. <laughs> yep. And AUs fix that too. If you've got like a character that you're just like, you know, I would really love to play and develop them, but they're just not capturing your interest at the moment, making a new AU for them, I think can really revive that interest. Yeah. And I, I think a lot of people are, at least from my experience, people always get concerned when, even if they're writing OCs, you're worried about stretching your character past a limit that like you don't think they would do. But sometimes even as people, we do things we wouldn't normally do sometimes. Mm -hmm. So let your character do things they're not supposed to do. You'll realize then that like there's a there's a lot more to do. Your RPs will be more fun. They'll there's lots of plots you can do. So I feel like don't be afraid to let your character explore different sides of themselves. Absolutely. I mean, characters are typically, uh, typically like a quote unquote good character, right, is more consistent than a person. But I think in role play, we get a lot of um, benefit from sometimes having our characters be a little bit more like people. And people in real life are unpredictable and crazy and do all kinds of things that make no sense, right, and aren't internally consistent, you know. <laughs> yes, so, um, so yeah, so I agree, like, let your character sometimes be internally inconsistent, you know. Excuse me, making another AU for them that's just like doesn't seem to match at all, I think can be like super, super helpful. Um, and, you know, it's a character like they're not real at the end of the day. So <laughs> I yeah, don't think it's a big deal. Them. <laughs> no, you can't defend them. They're fictional. So, you know, if you are stretching them, if you do end up feeling that way that you stretch them beyond what they're supposed to be, then just fix them back next time you write them. You know, like it doesn't it doesn't really matter. Like it, trying something new doesn't mean you can't go back if it turns out you didn't like it. Exactly, which I think goes along with not having, like you don't have to follow a timeline. You don't have to follow your character's timeline or mm -hmm. their personality. Like, I mean, obviously you want to keep your character it, to an extent similar, but like, don't worry about that. It's, it's not that important in the grand scheme of themes on certain platforms. Of course, when you're doing a Discord group, going out of timeline or something like that can be a little more difficult but um don't stick to a timeline you'll box yourself in and you will get bored yeah i totally agree with that i think this is one of something that works really well for one-on-ones unfortunately it doesn't work for groups where you've got lots of people you have to consider a timeline a little bit when you have um yeah. lots of people <laughs> uh because otherwise it just gets way too confusing and um and people can't really communicate properly if there's not some kind of timeline but if we're talking about like a one-on-one -on -one role play or we're talking about um, a small group where it's like maybe you and just a couple of friends, then you don't have to stick to the timeline. You can like randomly do a flashback or jump forward to something more interesting or whatever the case may be. Like you don't have to, you don't have to follow along like this scene is in this order and that's the order that we're going to role play them in you know so when you have more freedom to mess with your timelines like you do in a one-on-one -on -one situation or in a small group situation then i would definitely encourage you to do that like there's nothing there's no like writing rule that says you have to write every scene in order and a lot of people that are like novelists you know that write books they don't write them in order they a lot of people like just write the scenes in the order that they're interested in writing them and um, and then they kind of fill in the gaps afterwards when they've got the story basically finished. And you can kind of do the same thing with your role plays, only benefit because you're, you're not trying to publish or finish a novel or anything. You never have to go back and write the boring parts if you don't want to. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, literally. Um, yeah. Me, Summer, and Naomi, we have a, a, a group. And if we had wrote everything in order, I don't... <laughs> I mean, y'all oh wouldn't God. have still been doing the same one, all these, like, what is it? Y'all been going with that that one particular group for, what, seven years? Something crazy yeah, like seven, that? seven, eight years. And, like, we have, we we have, like, a, um, a present day timeline that we try to, like, place things around when we do them. But, like, we do not stick to that. That, <laughs> oh, my God. Like, <laughs> it would be a mess. So we go, we go forward. We go backwards. We, whatever you need to do to like give yourself content that you are feeling excited about writing yeah absolutely and because it's just you naomi and summer it's just three of you guys you can easily do that because you only have to work it out between the three of you um yeah. so yeah when you have the freedom to do that i highly highly encourage you to take advantage of it because not every role play situation 
has that possibility. Because I think once you get more than about, I don't know, four, four or five people or so, then you kind of have to have a timeline because otherwise it just, it doesn't really work. <laughs> yeah. In group settings, it would be really difficult. But yeah, um, yeah it would be burdensome. <laughs> <laughs> I could, yeah, I couldn't imagine that. But take advantage yeah. of it when you can. You will, you will find yourself being a lot more lenient and, again, excited about what you're writing. Yep, yep. If like all you want to do is write your fight scenes, or all you want to do is write your sexy scenes, or all you want to do is write your angsty scenes, like whatever it is, like you can just skip right to that. Nothing says you have to go in the order that it actually happens. It's not a big deal, you know. And and I think in one of the things that people get scared of with this is uh, is retconning. And and I'm I've said it in a couple videos, but I'm here to say again, not be scared to retcon stuff. Who cares? Like, it's just between you and the other people that you're writing with. Like, just, like, don't worry about, like, well, what if I get it wrong? Because you can just retcon it if it turns out you get it wrong because you ended up going out of order. Like, it is just, it's just not that big of a deal, you know? Yeah, you just keep it loose. Just be, be okay with making these decisions to better benefit the plots. Yeah, yeah, it's going to be more fun overall if you do it that way. Absolutely. Um, do we have anything else on keeping it loose? I feel like this, this, hopefully, hopefully y'all that are listening are, are getting convinced that like, it's not that serious and you can like keep things, uh, kind of loosey goosey and just do whatever you want and you don't really have to do things in a certain way. Um, but is there anything else you can think of like from Tumblr in particular, cause I know this is a platform that really benefits from this. That, that helps with, uh, you know, keeping things loose or things that people believe that they shouldn't do that really it's going to be fine and it's going to make things okay? Uh, I guess, I think you said it though, like writing multiple things at one time. Yeah. Yeah, that would be, but otherwise I think we, we did a good job at covering that. Okay. All right. So um, now that we've kind of talked about some of the like out of character, like communication, that type of stuff. Um, we want to actually talk about tension and conflict and things like that in, in the writing. So I have a couple of videos already on this. Um, I have like a building tension video. I have an action scenes video. I have an actual like types of conflict video and role playing conflict video. So for those of you guys that are really interested in these topics, if you want more after you've listened to what we have to say, then um, you can go watch those videos on my YouTube channel. They're spare room episodes. But um, but that being said, uh, you know how I feel, even though I have episodes on this on the channel, uh, I always want to be hearing other perspectives because I think that's how we learn. I think we learn from hearing from, you know, more people than just me. Right. <laughs> <laughs> um, so with that being said, uh, Brie, however you want to get started with some of this, of ac the actual like writing of tension, um, how do you like to do it? I think I, I think a good way to look at it is do like essentially a beginning a middle and an end um whether you want to emphasize on the beginning or you want to emphasize on the middle or at the end is completely up to you but kind of have a beginning goal and sometimes an end goal even if that end goal doesn't necessarily resolve the issue make sure you kind of know where you want to go oh um, okay so you mean like in the overall plot yeah so or yeah that would be my experience with that like you can vary it up like I said vary your pacing with the beginning or the middle of it or the end but if you you want to leave um room for suspense obviously mm -hmm. between you and your writer but kind of having some sort of idea in your head where you think you want to take your character's journey during any mostly any scene Mm, okay. Yeah, I hear what you're saying. I feel like I sometimes, um, sometimes I'm more of like a just let the characters decide and I don't really care. But if I if I'm writing a thread that is really like important to the plot of the character, then I will tend to plot it out a bit more. And I do do it kind of like what you're talking about. Like, I think some people that don't plot hear like about plotting and about planning and they think it's like, oh, I'm going to decide every little detail before I write it. But that's not the case, at least not no. for me. That's not how I do it. I typically have like a goal in mind of where the characters are going, like you said, 
And then I'm like writing towards that goal, but I don't decide any of the in-between stuff. I just know like, okay, they're gonna start here at point A and they're gonna get to point B. Maybe I have this point C that I know is happening in the middle, maybe not even. Sometimes I literally just have the beginning and the end and I don't figure out anything in the middle. Sometimes I have a few things in the middle, but um, but that's that's really all I'm doing as far as as far as that goes. And that definitely does help me with the actual like writing of the tension because I know where I'm going and um and it, then it's easier to actually implement some of like the pacing writing techniques and things of that nature right absolutely like if you even if like your say the end goal is the climax in the rp where like the big tension moment and you're trying to build to it and then you're trying to descend from it um even if you have that one moment in your head you can kind of vary how you get to it and how to how you um, lead away from it but I find a little bit of planning whether it's planning in your head or planning with your partner can be super beneficial to um, allowing you to figure out how you want it to look when you write mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. just that little bit of planning with them and this comes from like just going to or how it should how it should go anywhere how i believe it should go it should go from like you going to your partner with some kind of idea and then being like oh yeah and also this you know doing some of that yes and during that plotting phase <clears throat> definitely you want to be on some similar page with your writing partner of mm -hmm. course but you also want to um allow your partner a moment that when they read it they don't fully know what's coming because then it's exciting you're you want to know what's going to come next if you yes. know it's going to come next it's like getting to a part in a horror movie and you're like oh well that that didn't have the same effect because i knew that was going to happen yes so um that is something that like I think uh, I, th I really enjoy like I enjoy some surprises, dramatic surprises in uh, in my role plays. <laughs> yes, me too. Personally, personally, I know not everyone does like some people. If you surprise them with stuff that's too dramatic, they'll uh, get a little bit upset about that <laughs> and not really want it. But uh, but I personally really like it when something comes out and it's like, well, that's not what we planned or that's not what I expected to happen or that's not how I expected to get there, you know, um, and I think that's that's something that's very unique to the medium of role play is that emergent storytelling. So I think even if you're if you're doing kind of like the okay, I have this idea in mind, this is the goal that I'm going for, I think it's still important to not necessarily tell your partner every single little thing that you're thinking about um, the scene or every single thing you want to do, or even maybe not deciding yourself every single thing you want your character to do and kind of just letting the writing and the way that the character is going and the way that the scene's feeling guide you in your writing instead of kind of making those decisions beforehand. Um, and then you get that, that truly emergent storytelling that I think is so magical in role play. And like sometimes when you, when you read something, you obviously being surprised by it can then translate that sort of feeling of surprise in a way that maybe your character wouldn't, have felt because or like your character would feel obviously because mm -hmm. but you want to be able to like express those things properly and when you don't know it's coming you are more excited to write that surprise sometime absolutely and i know i've written stuff before that i'm like oh i didn't know it was going to turn out that way and then like i just wrote it and it did turn out that way like surprise myself which is always delightful <laughs> <laughs> yeah it's i i love those little moments in rp where like you you have you're doing a plot but you you don't know where it's going so mm -hmm. i think obviously um that's a great thing to do is leave leave an element of surprise for your your writing partner and even for yourself mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. yep so um so i think that's that's some of the benefit of not plotting out everything and i think and I think that that's like why some people that don't plot kind of like groan at the idea of plotting because they, they think it's that, but it's really not. Like there's a lot of benefit to not plotting too much also. Um, like sometimes there's benefits even to just picking a beginning and not really picking a goal and just letting the whole thing be a surprise. Um, now I know sometimes that turns into like meandering threads, which is why I, uh, which is why for important threads, I will still plot them out. But sometimes it's just like, hey, I want to write with this person. They seem cool. We're just going to throw these things together and see what happens. 
and uh, and all you do is pick a beginning and you don't pick anything else and then you get like something really crazy that you really did not expect and um and then it's really a, a nice surprise yeah so definitely playing on the on the benefits of plotting and then leaving things up to what happens when you write because sometimes even a thread will take it's not all going to happen in one day you're not going to sit this i mean sometimes sure you can do some back and forth but something you start on a monday might change in your head by the time you get to thursday or friday yeah i mean you've had so many sleeps in between there so you know you're you might get new and better and bigger ideas as you go absolutely, absolutely. yeah so, um <clears throat> Yeah, so I think I think like when it comes to keeping your writing like exciting and keeping you excited about writing, you really do have to strike a balance between plotting and not plotting. I think if you if you plot out everything, then that's going to be a struggle. If you don't if you um plot out nothing, then I think that's going to be a struggle too. Like I can't I don't think we we touched on this quite yet, but I think that that when you don't plot anything and you jump right in, and if those ideas if those ideas like don't come to you then i think that it feels that can feel a little bit boring as well and i think that's what's happening a lot of times with for, for people that are not plotting and getting bored um i think it's because like sometimes we expect the ideas just to come you know like we expect we expect it to be like actually the way that the greeks describe a muse you know it just it's creativity is just blessed upon you by the gods <laughs> And, and that is rain down. Yeah, and that's not how it works. That's not how it works. Like you have to put in a little bit of work. Like, yes, sometimes stuff just comes to you. But if you don't kind of like put in that effort, if you don't do things to like make the creative juices start to flow, then um, then you're going to struggle. And I do think that it can make things really, really boring for you if you don't put that effort in and try to plot at least a little bit you know, or have some ideas in your head, even if you don't plot them out with your partner. Yeah, definitely. Like you, there's always a good time to have those tiny threads where like you, you, you're essentially just writing miscellaneous, normal everyday things. But mm -hmm. when you're trying to write bigger scenes or you're trying to write pivotal scenes, some plotting is going to benefit you in the long run so that, you know, a week, two weeks, however long later, you are still invested in it because you've already ha had that moment of creativity. You, mm -hmm. you made yourself excited about it. And so the excitement will hopefully continue. It doesn't always happen that way. But um, even plotting a little bit at that point with your partner could be could be a real great moment. Yeah, absolutely. And you can always start this process even after the scene has started. Like if you are writing, like I think it's really good good if you're writing a scene and you get an idea that you want to execute, but you can't execute it within the next couple of posts. Um, instead of doing instead of doing that when you know it's going to take a while to get to it, like tell your partner so they can get excited about it too. And they can help you build to that really cool moment that you're thinking about in your head, right? So um, communicating those things I think is really important. And yeah, this is going to, oh, sorry, go ahead. No, go ahead. I was saying, and this is going <laughs> to help you. Like all of this stuff is going to help you with the actual like technical tension of the writing. So if you think about, um, if you think about like a, like a horror story or even a horror movie, like this is very much, this is very easy to conceptualize in movies and TV shows and stuff like that, right? When you're going through something like crazy or really dramatic or really um, traumatic even, it feels like everything is just like all of a sudden slowing down, right? Like we've been there, right? You got the adrenaline pumping. It seems like everything's moving in slow motion, you know? Um, you feel like you've got like crazy, crazy reflexes so that you can react to it. And I think that in writing, we can do the same thing where if something is really pivotal and you're going to know if it's pivotal because you've spent the time thinking about it beforehand, you've spent a little bit of time plotting um, or or you've just done it in your head. Right. And it's going to be a surprise for your for your uh, partner. But either way, like you've put some thought into it, you put some work into it so you can do that. You can just like take several sentences to write out something, even if in the reality of that character's life, it's happening like instantly, right? But that doesn't change the amount of words you use to describe it. So you can like slow things down by doing that. Or you can do the opposite. You can speed things up by like just describing things in very quick, 
short sentences with just like a word here and there, right? And I, I think that this, that those kinds of techniques, and since I'm describing them, like you probably know what I'm talking about, like you've seen it, you've read it in a book. I, I think that using those techniques is so much easier when you do just a little bit of that plotting, right? When you're, when you, you're able to build on things, or like you said, speed up things, when mm -hmm. you have this idea, again, whether it's just with yourself or with your partner, that you're trying to achieve. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So definitely vary up your, your pacing when things would be tense or when they would kind of be like shadowy and in the background. Like you want to really try to emphasize that with your writing. So then not only are you um, varying your pace, you're, you're building it. Mm -hmm. Like The Conjuring is creepy because like they hold on, you know, like in a horror movie, right? Like The Conjuring, you, you hold on things too long, right? Like you're looking at the same thing for too long or like um, things move, go by really fast and you can't see it because it just ran by the camera really fast or whatever, right? So yes. the amount of words you use has the same effect in your writing. Yeah, it's, it's all about like learning the tempo of a, a certain moment. Mm hmm. Mm hmm. Yep. And I, and I think that that's kind of knowing that how the pacing works like that is part of the reason that I'm like, not a huge fan of what I would call more restrictive writing styles. Like I think you're going to find the best tension if you have kind of like a basically single para slash multi para um, style of role play. I think that doing this tension stuff is a little bit difficult if you are somebody that's a, a one-liner exclusively, or if you're somebody that's like a novella role play style that writes like paragraphs and paragraphs and paragraphs every single post, right? So um, I think it's important to not be scared of uh, of doing what needs to be done as far as what's appropriate for the post and for that character, even if it doesn't match your typical post length. You know, sometimes a one sentence post can be really impactful on you and your partner. Um, I know I've experienced that before. It was like, wow, that was like the one punch thing that they needed to say. And it was only one line, but still it was amazing. Your post length can can sometimes concisely get the reaction you needed to get mm -hmm. and to put the point across. Like, I know. I, I write a lot of novel on Tumblr, but there are times where like there's a moment that I'm like, okay, you need, you need to stop writing because mm -hmm. you're not benefiting <laughs> anyone. <laughs> yep, yep, absolutely. And, and just kind of get the point across, get what you are trying to build and make it impactful. Yes, absolutely. Like no matter no matter how much of a novella role play writer you are. Um, there's going to be times where a post just that, where that's just not appropriate for that particular post for that particular scene or whatever it is, right? <clears throat> Absolutely, yeah. There, force yourself to stop writing. Sometimes more writing does not have the effect you want it to have. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Sometimes you just end up meandering and you absolutely kill any tension that could potentially be in that really dramatic scene. So it's definitely something like that I have struggled with on Tumblr specifically mm -hmm. for aesthetic purposes, which is ridiculous, but <laughs> yeah. <laughs> oh my gosh. But you have to be aesthetic on Tumblr. I mean, <laughs> you are right? yeah, <laughs> yeah. That's how, that's kind of like how that is. That's kind of how that is. We have, we have a whole episode of interstage window where we talk about um, Tumblr role plays. It's um, a Naomi episode. <laughs> And I'm sure you would probably agree with like most of the stuff that we talk about in there. <laughs> yeah, I remember that. Yeah. Oh gosh. Yeah, that's a whole <laughs> thing on there. But yeah, um, definitely <laughs> change up your writing size to what is meant to be for that certain topic. Yep, absolutely. Absolutely. Um and uh and I think and and again, like this stuff is just easier if you do just the tiniest amount of plotting. Um, but I want to, I want to also take some time when we're talking about some of this stuff in the, in the writing and talk specifically about like action scenes. Um, because I think that, uh, that for a lot of us in role play, we're mostly writing slice of life and conversations and stuff like that. And that is important. And that is a huge part of role play, but sometimes you're going to want to write an action scene, right? So, um, so Brie, when you actually want to like write that dramatic Thing or that fight scene or whatever, how do you do it? 
Um, so I find that that personally, I think plotting is super beneficial to the action scene part. So I will always start with plotting. And that is really specifically where my um, beginning, middle, and end will sort of come up. Mm. Because the the action part to me, um, you ha- especially when you're writing it with somebody, you have to kind of figure out, well, what's that character going to react? Because you want it to be, in some ways, realistic. Like if you're writing an action scene and your character's getting punched, you know, five times your char- the other character is going to have an effect. You don't just get punched five times and nothing happens unless <laughs> you're a vampire. But like, <laughs> you don't you know wanna- me, Bree. I can get punched five times. No, I can't. I mean, you in real life, you get punched once and you're down. <laughs> yeah, exactly. So you have to think about how your action that you are putting out into the roleplay is going to be received and vice versa. How is that character punching your character going to affect your character Mm -hmm. yeah for sure um and i think it kind of depends right like some some genres are more realistic than others (laughs) yes sure. (laughs) like if i'm writing something with comic book characters there's probably going to be a little bit more dialogue in the action scene um, cause they're going to like quit back and forth and, you know, things aren't, things are going to be like, um, not really make much sense, you know, where it's like, wait, why didn't, why didn't this dude get sucker punched? Like, I don't understand. But, yeah. um, <laughs> but if I'm writing like, you know, some realistic mobsters or something, then, um, I think it's important to try to keep it a little bit more realistic. You know, if somebody takes the time to make a smart remark, they're not going to finish that smart remark. They're going to get punched in the face. <laughs> you <Yeah>. know? <laughs> Most of my action scene experience would definitely be in like a mobster role play. So I think um, a realistic sort of vibe helps. I mean, not always because you're writing characters that you want to live in and, you know, go forward. <laughs> but <laughs> yeah, um, try to have some sort of balance between what could really work and what is just you know you're writing an action scene and then it ends up being miscellaneous because there's there's no end point there was no point to it yeah oh i think that's the worst right like i think i think in um in role play a lot of times if we don't have some kind of ending in mind and, and scenes just meander um when this happens in an action scene i think it's especially awkward you know um <laughs> because it's like the fight just keeps going and going and going and it's like my god, why isn't one of them dead yet? <laughs> like, this this is not working. And then it comes into, like, sort of a power play and balance where it's like, okay, there is always usually a character in a fight that you go, okay, they're, if they kick someone in the ribs, it is probably going to break their ribs because they are stronger. Mm-hmm. Um, or even just in general, like, uh, you kick someone in the right place, it's going to hurt and it's going to cause an effect. Yeah, they're gonna be down. Yeah. <laughs> like, um, so I think it, then it has power play where you feel like your character's strengths, especially if they have a fighting strength, isn't being um, looked at. It's kind of just being skimmed over. Like, eh, my character's fine. Mm-hmm. Yeah, but they really wouldn't be. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah, it doesn't work like that. Yep, and you don't want the other person to get frustrated because them getting frustrated is what's going to start making their posts their posts not as good for you, and then um, you know then you're both going to be bored, <laughs> and then we're back really? at kind of square one, right? In this kind of original stuff that we talked about about trying to keep things loose so you don't get bored, right? Yeah, and I think like when you're writing in a small group of people, like it's it's kind of easier to be like, okay, well my character this time can lose but sometimes and your character can lose it's totally acceptable don't be afraid to take you know the the losing side of a fight but um in a group rp then it can kind of spread where it's like okay Mm -hmm. this character did that they're strong but now my character doesn't have to be affected either because that character wasn't Mm -hmm. yeah absolutely it leads to issues and when you're writing you don't you don't want those issues you you want things to work you want things you want both people that are writing the scene to be happy essentially at some point (laughs) for sure yep 
Um, and I think another thing with action scenes, and then this can happen with other some other kinds of scenes too. I feel like this happens with angsty scenes, and this happens with um, with sexy scenes as well. I feel like these these three types of scenes have a lot of things in common. But anyway, this happens with all of those kinds of scenes where um, they just kind of people start them because like the idea of like having a fight is exciting but they don't really think about how that's going to affect the characters in like a personality way and so i think it's always important like when you're writing these scenes that are supposed to be tense that are supposed to be like crazy action whatever that you think about how that's going to change your character um because if you think about like your character in in terms of um the changes that they go through and the things that they experience you know getting into a fight is going to change their personality. You know, even if there's a character that, that likes fighting, you know, the winning or losing, it's going to change them in some way. Either make them, maybe make them more or less confident, maybe um, make them think a certain thing about the person that they got into the fight with. You know, um, these sorts of things change characters' opinions, personalities, um, especially if you have like a fight scene where the character gets actually injured. Like, I know, I know that uh, every hospital experience that I have had has definitely done things to change my behaviors and my thoughts on certain things because you don't want to end up there again. And I feel like um, fight scenes are the same way. You will write something about our characters, you know, getting really beat up and really suffering injuries and things like that. And then like in the next scene, they're just fine and it's like it didn't affect them. And I know that always brings me out of it a little bit because that just so doesn't match every time that I have had an injury in my life or really anyone that I know. You know, these things affect us and they make us they make us change our thoughts and behaviors. And I think that that should happen for characters, too. Like um we all write because we we like the fantasy of it but oh yeah there, there has to be some sort of um consequence i guess for for what happens even when you're writing a strong character like putting that strong character up against maybe an even stronger um character that's like you said going to affect their confidence it's going to affect how maybe the next time you have the opportunity to write a fight scene that character approaches it and you can really mm -hmm. play on that and allow your character to have feelings that otherwise maybe before this fight or action scene or even sexy scene anything like that they didn't feel mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. it, it allows you to explore things in your writing that you can now continue to build upon so it wasn't this you know this pointless fight that you wrote there's um going forward there's consequences there's consequences yeah yeah there's consequences afterwards um, cause I think that's where, that's where when it comes to tension in writing, where as, as role players and trying to keep consistent characters and just trying to have fun, that sometimes we kind of kill it for ourselves, right? Because we don't have consequences, we will end up in the situation where it's like, it's unfun and we don't understand why it's not fun anymore and why it's boring us. And it's like, because there were no consequences to the action, I think it's a big reason that that happens. Yeah, and especially if you're going to take that character and try to write against the character that they just fought, whether it's a physical fight or an argument or, you know, whatever it is, how they're going to talk to that character next is it's not going to be the same. I mean, mm -hmm. unless, you know, it's two friends they fought and now they're fine, which... Well, they made up, but they yeah. still have to go make up first. <laughs> yeah, like, they're having... Use what happened and benefit your character benefit or you know uh not benefit your character however you want it to be um use that really take that opportunity and you know run with it yeah i think sometimes as role players we can be quite quite confident consequence averse for our characters you know and uh, and i think that's kind of what makes it boring like if you think about your favorite book or your favorite movie or your favorite tv show like bad things happen to the characters you know they get hurt they they go through changes they go through trauma you know bad just in general bad things happen to them and i think in role play sometimes especially when it comes to like action and fight scenes but other scenes as well uh we get so consequence averse when it comes to our characters that we just like we just like move on as if the big crazy thing that happened to them never happened. And I know that it's that part of the reason why people do this is because they're like, oh, well, you know, it's it's nerve wracking. It's scary. I don't you know, I don't want the consequences, you know, because I don't want consequences in real life. I mean, who does? But this is fiction. OK, this is fiction, not real life. And so what I think ends up happening is um, 
is because we're we're kind of like that consequence averse in reality. We push that onto our characters and we accidentally make our role plays boring because we don't let the action scenes do what action scenes should do. You know, we don't let them have consequences at the end. Absolutely. Yeah. Even any any movie, any movie, you think about that big action set piece in the middle of the movie, there is consequences to the plot right after that big action set piece every single time. And if there's not, it's probably a bad movie. <laughs> yeah, even, even on like TV shows, sometimes I'll watch and this big moment will happen, happen. And then two episodes later, it's like it didn't. And sometimes that happens where like some things are only going to affect people characters for a certain amount of time the way they would people but you mm -hmm. know, sometimes when you have those really big pivotal moments you want it to stick you want it to build your character towards you know something else yep um yep. so definitely do not shy away from that you are you'll end up hurting yourself in the long run by not using that to your advantage absolutely because if you're not going to have consequences for your characters if they're not going to go through bad things then that's what's going to make you bored yeah, and it's going to make even your partners lose interest because the, it, it it's a hobby that you can't do by yourself. You have exactly. to be writing with other people. And when people see that constant, they're going to maybe potentially shy away from it, from yeah. writing those types of things with you. And you will get bored. <laughs> Yeah, absolutely. And I think like, I really think that that's the worst. That's the worst thing that you can do when it comes to when it comes to writing and when it comes to role play. Like there's all kinds of like awful faux pas and horror stories and things that people get annoyed with ghosting, whatever, whatever. But I really think like the worst thing that you can do to a role play partner <laughs> is to bore them. <laughs> so because um, that's what actually is going to make people not stick and um, and make you lose partners and uh, and things of that nature. Like that's that's like a major factor that I think we don't consider a lot of times for focusing on things like, you know, ghosting and people acting crazy. And, you know, I mean, you know how it goes. It's role play. People get people get crazy. <laughs> um, but I think that, that in reality, what really causes people to like drop things is being bored. Yeah, definitely. And it's so easy with those other things to be like, OK, well, that was their choice. But you when doing these things and not allowing consequences to, you know, happen that ends up falling on you and I think that's where the issue is is like we don't like to look to ourselves we don't want there to be an issue but yeah so definitely consequences that would be one of the main things for that I would say there yeah absolutely let your big scenes have consequences so that your characters can learn and grow and change and that just the act of allowing them to change is going to make things more interesting for you and make you stick with them longer and stick with that character longer and stick with that plot longer and all of that fun stuff that I know everybody wants to be doing, you know? We, we all want to be writing those things, so go ahead mm -hmm. and write them and don't be afraid to let them affect your character afterward. <laughs> Absolutely. Absolutely. Um, and I have a whole video on action scenes, like if you liked some of this stuff and you want to, you know, hear more about it, I have a whole video on that. You can check that out on my channel, which goes into a lot more detail um, and specifics on like action scenes in particular, because I know that's one for a lot of role players that uh, that out of all the different kinds of exciting scenes that they write, that's probably the more rare one is the action scenes. Don't you bust out that? Oh, no, elephant. <sighs> I thought a fence would help. Anyways, <laughs> <You got Sorry>. away. <laughs> it got away. It got away. <laughs> um, Sorry, random break to talk about the game. Uh, <laughs> so, uh, so yeah, I think that that is really, really important when it comes to those those big scenes is to just not let them, don't let them be like that. Let your characters have consequences for their actions, for the things that they went through. You know, don't pretend like it didn't happen. Because that's part of what's going to make you bored. And your partners get bored. Yep. And then it's not fun and exciting and you're just kind of sitting there going, well... That was, that was it. <laughs> yep. Consequences is what's going to make it exciting. <laughs> yes. Um, and with that being said, I wanted to take a minute to talk about like role playing conflict in general, because this kind of is similar to the action scenes in the sense that um, a lot of role players, I think, struggle with role playing conflict. And because they never let anything bad happen to their characters, never let them get mad at anything, never let them make mistakes, whatever, 
Um, and then they get bored and they don't realize like why they're so bored with their role play. And it's like, well, it's because you don't ever let your character have conflict. So like we're going to back up basically. We're going to back up from consequences to conflict. And I want to just briefly talk about um, a video that I made a while ago on my channel that talks about types of conflict, just to give you all some context, because conflict doesn't necessarily have to be like your character got into an argument with this other character, or your character doesn't like this other character anymore, or stuff like that. Like, it doesn't have to be so blatant. That's just one type of conflict. That would be like man versus man conflict, and interpersonal issues with one with one particular person. But it can be a lot more than that, right? There are man versus self conflicts, which are conflicts between a person and themselves. So like it's some, you know, individual turmoil that they may be experiencing on the inside, right? <laughs> um, there's also man versus technology conflicts, you know, uh, somebody that's kind of, that's like fighting against uh, the technology of their world and they're fighting, things are changing in their world and it's scary, right? And that's like the conflict that's going on. It could be man versus society conflict. So you find this a lot of times in, in speculative fiction um, or, or any kind of dystopias or things like that. Like Hunger Games is a good example of this. It's, um, it's a man versus society conflict, right? Like Katniss and, uh, and crew are trying to take down the capital. Like they're trying to change their whole society in those books. Um, and uh, then there is man versus supernatural, which is like every Final Fantasy game you've ever played where you go and kill God. <laughs> um, so that was a super brief rundown of that, but I just wanted to give that really quick. Uh, I have a video that describes all of those in a lot more detail if there's any of them that you haven't heard of before. But if you're if you're um, used to writing advice, you have probably seen the exact list that I cover in that video and, and know what I'm talking about at this point. Um, does that make sense, Bree? Do you think I, I covered that good? Is there any of those that you want to add something something to the definition of? I think you, I think you covered it. Okay. Looking at it, yeah. All right. So then, when it comes to just regular like conflict in your role plays, not necessarily action scenes or anything, but just any kind of conflict, um, how do you like to do it? Like, what's your what's your I guess your your top tips for role playing conflict? Um. So. I personally, with conflict, I like there to be a reason for the conflict. Mm. Just writing conflict to have conflict. Um, I mean, sometimes uh, the characters, you will have characters who like to engage in conflict just for, you know, the heck of it. But having a reason allows your writing to, allows you to have more things to write. Whereas if you're, you're, there's no reason for it, you're kind of just writing and it goes on and on. And that, then again, that's where you get to meandering. So my very first thing I like to do is going, okay, well, why is my character, you know, angry or upset or disappointed enough to start a conflict about it? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So I, And I there should be a... Oh, sorry, go ahead. I just think having a reason is super beneficial to writing conflict. Yeah, absolutely. And I think making sure that you've that you've got that reason being in character, right? So like yes. the yeah, when I hear that, like one of the things <laughs> one of the things that happens in role play is I don't like this person, so I'm gonna create conflict between their characters and my characters. Like, no, that's not what we're talking about here. <laughs> we're not writing self inserts. I mean, if you are that that's you, but um <laughs> that's not really what we're talking about. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, so yeah, absolutely. I think I think that uh, that giving that reason for why your character is either going to start that conflict or how your character got involved in that conflict or why it matters to them or whatever um, is really important. Like I totally agree with that. Uh, just starting conflict to start it, it's kind of it kind of goes back to some of the tension stuff that we talked about it's it just it gets boring if there's not a reason behind it then it just it gets boring and you just go on forever and you don't even know why your character's doing it or what they really want out of it at the end so um yeah i i totally agree with you having that why reason is really really important um there's there is nothing worse for me than sitting there and writing a thread that goes on and on where you're like I don't even know what I'm talking about it like what they're talking about anymore <laughs> like I don't know what to physically write that my character could say that hasn't been reiterated already maybe three to five times 
Yeah, yeah, and that can get so frustrating because um, I think that uh, that when it comes to that stuff, like we just we just want to we just want to write like our characters doing fun things, but um, but because but because we can go on and on and like sometimes you don't want to be the person that's like okay we have to end this, but uh, but it's time to end it, you know. So um, I think it is really, really important when it comes to when it comes to this role playing conflict. I, I agree. Like to find out why. Like why does your character want to do this? Because if you know that, then you can push forward and you can actually figure out an ending, right? Going back to the plotting stuff that we were saying. If you know why, you can actually kind of plot it out with the other person, or at least within your head of how you sort of kind of want it to go, so that you can push forward and you don't get to a point where you're where you're having those feelings like you're talking about, where it's like wait why am I doing this I don't remember yeah. <laughs> exactly and it, it even goes back to like um another tip I would say is like consequences but sometimes that consequence is having no consequence like or n not um having no resolution to it yes like, your character like a person is not always going to leave this you know argument that they had feeling oh well I feel so great about that and like I'm so glad we fixed it don't fix it don't be afraid to not fix it <laughs> yeah you don't have to sometimes arguments end with both people walking away and that's totally yes. fine and I don't think that's a big deal um Katie says I always worry that I'm jumping the gun on ending scenes I don't know um I end scenes pretty quickly but uh, I've had that feeling before Katie especially when it comes to some of these like more tense scenes and it's like okay it's time for it to end I want it to end and I've definitely got the sense from roleplay partners before that they found that offensive, <laughs> which I really don't understand because when I end a scene, I'm never saying like, we can't have more in the future. Like it's always like ending this scene to make room for other scenes and we can just start a new one if you want to. But I do think some role players take it that way of like ending a scene is like offensive because when are we going to have the next scene? Um, I don't know. Uh, I definitely experienced that a lot on Tumblr when I was role playing there, and I've even experienced it some on Discord, to be honest, uh, where I felt like I the person was like offended that I was like I'm done with this scene and I want to do a new one. <laughs> um, <laughs> yeah, go ahead. Yeah, don't. I mean, there are times where like sometimes you you need to push through writing things, but like if it's not working and the purpose has you know reiterated and reiterated itself end it there is room for more and whether that comes in the future or you know it comes when you end that thread that's okay yeah i would agree with that i mean i i would prefer scenes end a little sooner in most role plays i'll put it that way <laughs> yeah. i think i more often find myself meandering in scenes that i don't care about than the other way around you know where i'm upset someone wants to end a scene but i do know there's role players that feel the opposite so i totally hear what you're saying katie sure so i think in have... addition oh sorry go ahead no i was just gonna say if you have any if you had any tips but you were going ahead so yeah i know i was gonna move i was gonna move back to the role-playing conflict because i think in addition to to that why that you're talking about so that you can really kind of know what you're doing in the scene i think another really important piece is to give it stakes like what's gonna happen if your character loses this argument What's going to happen if they don't resolve it, like you were saying, right? What's going to happen if they do resolve it? You know, like, and this, this goes back to the consequences. I think when we're role-playing conflict, it can feel kind of cheap if the consequences are cheap, you know? Like, why is my character going to care about winning an argument where the win, where if they win, like, nothing actually happens, you know? So I think it's really important to, to give those stakes as in like if your character loses like something bad's gonna happen to them like maybe they're gonna lose out on some money or they're going to you know maybe it ends up in a breakup between your character and and their partner or you know maybe they end up like estranged from their children or i don't know like whatever kind of dramatics you can think of i feel like we have to have some kind of stakes and if we don't that's when we get into these situations where like it's like wait why are they even having the fight to begin with this doesn't make sense anymore because i don't know what's going to happen if they win or lose and then it's very hard to care about carrying that conflict through absolutely and like the, again i feel like 
people shy away from wanting to lose some lose the fight because they're like, okay, well then they lose, lost, and then what? Losing yeah, can sometimes be be one of the more beneficial sides to writing something. Like mm-hmm. there are a lot of emotions that come with losing something. Yeah, um, whether that's losing something physical or you know, losing something emotionally, like play on it allow your character to lose sometimes losing will open up a plethora of doors Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. that's like where the character development happens right like um like this isn't really spoilers because this happens in episode one okay but (laughs) losing the fight right losing the fight in uh in shadow and bone in the very beginning of it is how her powers come about, right? And and we see that trope so often in media where like the loss is what makes like the amazing thing happen or whatever. So I think like play on that, like let the losing do something, change something for your character, change the stakes, let it, let it change them emotionally, let it change them physically, you know, whatever it is. Um, and I feel like a lot of role players feel like their character's loss is like their own personal loss. And I guess I just don't, feel that way. I, I know it's very, it you like you get into your character, right? And some amount of character bleed is impossible to not have uh, because we care, right? Pe- humans have emotions. Oh my God, <laughs> news flash. Spoiler. <laughs> <laughs> what? <laughs> and, and I think because of that, you know, a little bit of character bleed happens. And so that's what makes us like scared of the conflict and scared of having those consequences and scared of giving the con if we do have conflict scared of giving it stakes but if you do give it stakes and you get to have that change in your character that's when that adrenaline release happens that makes the role play really really fun again it makes you excited and makes you interested so that's why stakes are so important because it's gonna it's because it's like a fictional world right like they're not real consequences and they're not real conflicts <laughs> so it's like a roller coaster you can safely have that crazy adrenaline release even if you, you wouldn't want it in real life you have it in the fiction and then you're excited and you're interested again sure and um even saying that winning can be losing it can not- be like your character will sometimes there will be times where they will walk away and they will feel like oh my god i just won confidence boost but sometimes even especially in like an action scene or even in conflict like the win does not always feel good um a, an example i don't know if anyone has seen the hundred here but when oh, yeah. clark <laughs> um clark pulls the lever in season 2 and you know people die because of it their people won but there was there was a lot of consequences and that winning didn't feel good. No. So allow your character if they win to feel the the loss and the pain that doesn't actually feel like winning. Yeah, oh I I love that example because that's a good example of no matter like the way that that was set up in the show, no matter what Clark did, it was going to be bad. The loss yeah. yeah, because no matter no matter either either she was her side was going to lose a lot of people or the other side was going to lose a lot of people, no matter what she chose. And um, I think conflict like that is where you get like the best tension. And that's why CW shows do that, right? Because they're set up like soap operas. Um, if you've not realized this, <laughs> then spoilers, I guess. But yeah, CW shows are structured the way that they're structured. It's just like just like a soap opera to keep you watching every week, right? That's why they're so crazy dramatic and ridiculous. Um, but you can set up your role plays like that too. And that will keep them way more interesting. Like there's a reason people get obsessed with soap operas. So if you create situations of conflict where no matter what your character chooses, there is no good outcome for them. And that's a really great way to keep things exciting, no matter what, because no matter what you choose, your character is not going to feel that great about it. And uh, and that's why soap operas do what they do and do the crazy things that they do uh, is because that's what keeps it interesting. and keeps it exciting and role play self-indulgent anyway. So I think it's more it's more uh, beneficial to do what's fun as opposed to what would be considered like good writing. (laughs) Sorry, everyone be cringe and cheesy. That's just that's what I think. That's what I think that boils down to. Uh, but yeah, when you're giving your conflict stakes, if there's a way you can create a no win situation, that is going to be ideal for making things really dramatic and interesting. Like right for me, one of the best parts about writing is writing emotions. I love to 
you know, delve into those the nitty gritty. And those opportunities, they they don't always come. It is hard sometimes to write them. But when you find that moment, then you can go, okay, there is going to be a winner and a loser. But there's there's no real winning. Those are so fun to write. And there's so much after that that you can go ahead and delve into that like it's not going to just immediately get better so take those opportunities when they come yeah absolutely um curriculum live oh my gosh welcome to the stream i think this is the first time that i've seen you in here so really excited to have you uh this is a great question we are talking about text-based role plays uh, my YouTube channel and also the Saturday streams that we do, they are all about text-based role plays for the most part. Um, sometimes we talk about stuff that uh, that applies to tabletop, and as you know, if you do both, there's a ton of crossover between the two. But we are primarily talking about text-based role plays, not really tabletop. Um, but I think a lot of this applies to tabletop, you know? Like as a DM, when you're creating the conflict for your players creating something where no matter what the players choose, there's going to be some consequence. Like, I still think like that's good, you know, and that's still like keeping things tense and exciting because D&D has the same problems that a lot of role play has where people will do it for a while and then they get bored and then like the whole game falls apart and you never meet again. <laughs> you know? Yes. I mean, I can't, I can't think of very many D&D &D groups where we've actually finished uh the plot that the dm originally set out either the group falls apart before we get there or we find something way more interesting and derail it and don't do what the dm wanted us to do anyways <laughs> that's the two that's the two outcomes i've had of tabletop games <laughs> so yeah i think these tips apply to that too for sure <clears throat> yeah letting loose is a huge thing oh sorry go ahead brie oh i was just saying from like what i've watched from like youtube videos and stuff like a lot of this specific topic definitely applies to some D&D. &D. Yeah, yeah, absolutely, absolutely. For sure. Um, so yeah, I think I think that when it comes to keeping things exciting, creating no-win situations or just stakes at all, I think is really important. So this is like the specifics of the way that I think about it is when I'm kind of creating the conflict, I think about like, okay, so this is the situation that's happening to the character. And I start, I build kind of a decision tree in my head of if character does this, then this is what gonna, what's going to happen. If the character does this, then this is what's going to happen. So I already kind of know uh, when we're kind of towards the beginning of it, the different possible outcomes and the different like things that might happen based on those outcomes. And that will help drive and keep me interested in actually playing out the conflict and, and getting to the conflict and all of those good things. And I think when you don't think about that and you just focus on my character needs to win and you don't really think about the consequences and you don't really think about what's going to happen next, then you end up sometimes picking that whatever the less dramatic option is. And it's like you're bored and it's like, well, I wonder why. And it's, it's obvious upon reflection, but when you're in the middle of it and you're just trying to win, I think it's not so obvious that that strategy is like, is hurting yourself and hurting, you know, staying interested in the role play. Yeah. So let, let it lose and let winning be losing too. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yep. Consequences, consequences. And I want to circle back. a big topic. <laughs> Yes. <laughs> um, and I want to circle back to something that you had that you had touched on earlier, but I want to like give it some focus. So you don't have to have a resolution at the end. Um, Brie, you had a really good example of the of like the stakes and the conflict and stuff like that with like Clark and the 100. Um, can you think of an example where there was like no real resolution at the end of the conflict in a role play that you've done? I feel like um, Octavia and Lucian in uh, in Freya have had some of that. Oh, I find, okay, for me, writing siblings is one of those things where, like, resolutions do not always happen. You just <laughs> kind of, <laughs> you have to go forward because um, if sometimes having a resolution means that that is over and you feel like going forward, you cannot bring it up again. It It's kind of, you know, it's in the past. Mm -hmm. But um, specifically, I'm trying to think of a specific example. I don't know why my brain is... 
Oh, thank you so much for the follow curriculum. Uh, sorry, I kind of put you on the spot. I just kind of assumed because I know like Octavia and Lucian are kind of like constantly in it. So I'm like, I bet she has a good one with those two. But maybe not. Like I might be wrong. <laughs> I... The memory of a goldfish sometimes. I swear. <laughs> um, well, in but... general, in general, while, while Brie is thinking, I can I can give some some general stuff if you want. Um you know, when I was kind of referring to with Octavia and Lucian, like they, they are siblings in this role play that we're doing. Uh, and, uh, and Brie plays one of them and Naomi plays the other. And, uh, and sometimes they have arguments and fights that just don't go anywhere. There's just like sibling squabbling. And, and it is like, okay, well, Octavia and Lucian are just not allowed to talk about this topic anymore because when they do, it just turns up into a whole big old mess of a fight. And, and I, when I read those threads that you guys do, they feel like so real to me because that's so real. You know, like when you have a fight with a family member or with your spouse or with a kid or like basically somebody that you really care about, um, you, you prioritize like that relationship over the conflict. And sometimes the answer is just literally like, okay, we're not going to talk about this anymore. You know, it's like that one friend that you're just like, we just don't talk about politics because they cannot have a polite conversation when it comes to politics. You know what I mean? <laughs> <laughs> and so yes. I feel like it's like that. I feel like it's a lot like that. And uh, and those threads are always such a, a joy to read and they're very exciting. <laughs> I actually, you said it and then I remembered. Oh, good. Um, oh, good. There's a moment where, so Octavia has kind of like repressed some childhood thing that she will not... She, She's like, no, I didn't repress them. She obviously repressed them. She knows she did. Uh -huh. um, and <laughs> Lucian decided to um, bring it up one day. And she was not having it. So where that went was a whole lot of, we're not talking about this. I will ignore it every time it's brought up. And there was no end. There is still currently no end. Um, he, he can't really do anything about it because... When you're full-grown adults, you don't really have to listen to other people. <laughs> <laughs> Amazing. <laughs> so, um, in that specific circumstance, you, for instance, going back on what we've talked about, we gave it stakes. Octavia now realizes that she has these repressed memories. Mm -hmm. But there, there's no resolution. Nothing is being done about it. it they, they argued. I'm sure in the future they will argue again about it. <laughs> yep. Yep, and now but, it's just this tense thing between them that just that just exists, where Lucian knows this thing about her that she's that she's repressing and she refuses to acknowledge it, and he just kind of has to live with this knowledge that she's you know being crazy about this situation, right? And just deal with it. And sometimes that is exactly what needs to happen. Like yep. you are not, things are not always going to be resolved to this happy, dreamy landscape that you have created. <laughs> Yep. Yep. Um, absolutely. And again, it will help you with other RPs going forward with that character, and you can even play on them in other role plays with other people, like other characters. Mm -hmm. So sometimes having no resolution is better than having, you know, a resolution. Mm hmm. Yep. Yep. Sometimes that keeping that tension there between the two characters is the best thing that you can do. <laughs> absolutely. <laughs> mm-hmm. Yep. Uh, Kendra, I'm so happy you're back. Um, rewarding myself with stream time after getting a single reply done. That's a big mood. <laughs> I love that for you, Kendra. <laughs> yep. <laughs> uh, all right. So I think, I feel like at this point, we covered most of what we wanted to wanted to cover. Um, I know it's almost article time, but is there anything that you would like to say, Brie, that kind of like ties all of this stuff together with keeping your RPs fresh and exciting? Um... My, the biggest theme I think that we've been talking about is don't be afraid to do the thing. Yeah. Whatever it is, don't shy away from it. Shying away from it is not going to make you happier about having to write it. Yep. You're not going to forget that you didn't, that you're not enjoying what you're writing. So m maybe put yourself in an, a slightly uncomfy, not uncomfy, like with your partner, but like just do the thing you will you'll yeah. will benefit from it like uncomfy with yourself like write yeah. write something it's okay to write something that makes you feel a little uncomfortable i think that's even a good thing for you in a lot of ways and it's definitely going to keep things exciting because if you're comfortable all the time then you're bored you know 
So yeah, I, yeah, I think that's, that's definitely it. If you're comfortable, you're bored. All right. Yeah. So, um, as y'all saw, Ella Fanilla did not resident up. It seems to be resetting. Every time it comes back to the garden, it seems to not remember the things it's already eaten. So I'm going to have to Google this and see if it's something that's like a bug in the game with that particular pinata. Because I don't know if I want to do a whole nother episode just watching and waiting for one of those to resident up. We might skip it and just move on to the last Dragonosh and not get Elephanilla. We'll see. I'll do some Googling and see and see what we're going to do. Um, but I'm going to go ahead and save the game there. I've never been able to get an Ella Vanilla. Yeah, I, I, I know that I have, but I feel like maybe it was just dumb luck. Because, like, I watched it. I've, I watched it get two check marks, and then it came back, and it didn't have any check marks. So something is up with that. Um, so we might we might actually not get the full the full um, awards for this game, because I don't want to... I don't want to sit and bore y'all. Like, I want y'all to have something fun to watch while we're talking, you know? <laughs> um, okay. So, Brie... Bree, you had an article picked out for us, right? What's our what's our good news for today? Oh, indicate. Me? Pull yes. It and if you so, could link it for me, either in the if you could link it for me in the Twitch chat, do you have the a way to copy it into there? The way you got your setup. Yeah. All right. There. Perfect. There we go. Okay. A super pink moon. Ooh, spectacular super pink moon set to rise next week. Here's how to photograph it in the night sky. So, Brie, what's a pink moon? The... Hello? Oh, I think she just disconnected. Well, anyway, I can tell you what a super moon is. So a super moon is whenever the moon is the closest to the Earth, and so it shows really, really big in the sky. So I know that's what a super moon is. Um, let's see if we can see if this will tell us what a pink moon is. Hey, welcome. Welcome. Um, yes, homo drew. I said your name right this time. How's it going, drew? <laughs> All right. So this is, let's see. Bree, are you back? Yeah, I don't know what happened. <laughs> okay, I'm so sorry. Um, what I was asking is, what is a pink moon? So I know what a super moon is, so I just explained that, but what is a pink moon? I believe from what I have read, it's in this article, that it's the way, it's kind of like how the sky turns pink, where it's setting on the horizon. So those, that's what creates the actual pink in the moon. Oh, Okay. It's so, an illusion. Gotcha. So it's like something that's happening in the sky. So it's because of the Raleigh scattering, it says, whatever that is. I guess that's what you're talking about, the Raleigh scattering. Yeah. The same phenomenon that causes sunsets to take on a reddish hint. And then contrary to its name, this month's full moon won't actually look pink, according to the Farmer's Almanac. It actually gets its name from the North American wildflower, Phlox sub -subut subulata? Okay. Also known as the creeping flocks or moss flocks. Okay, that's way easier to say. Which blooms in the spring. <laughs> Other say traditional. It's not sp Sorry, go ahead. Oh, you're good. You're good. They um they say that it's not supposed to look pink, but the last pink supermoon we had actually did. Oh, I guess that's what this picture is from because this looks real pink to me. This looks real yeah. pink for the moon. Yeah, for sure. And so I'm hoping that it'll be the same this time. Yeah, so it says other traditional names for this include Sucker Moon, Breaking Ice Moon, Egg Moon, Wildcat Moon, and Budding Moon of Plants and Shrubs. So yeah, so this is going to be, you want to do this on Monday evening, so April 26th. So just this coming up Monday, this coming up Monday evening, that's going to be the best time to see this super pink moon. It's appearing over the eastern horizon. Because it's going to start at deep tangerine, then city gold, then pure white as it climbs higher in the sky. So basically, you gotta you gotta you gotta get a look at it when you're in a field, so that you can see it as close to the horizon as possible. It seems like. Yeah, if you're in the city, I think the lights of the city will definitely dim any coloring you'd be able to see. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it sounds like it. It sounds like it. 
Oh, Curriculum has a fun moon story. So my fiance and I went to a completely blind and pitch black restaurant for her birthday the first year we started dating, and it was dang wild because after we emerged from the pitch blackness into the bright again, a freaking blood moon was happening. It felt like we emerged into an ending world. That sounds like, um, that sounds like, um, Majora's Mask, all of a sudden walking out and the moon's like in your face and looking scary. <laughs> <laughs> Oh my gosh, dawn of the third day. <laughs> okay, it says, if you do want to try taking one of these spectacular photos where the moon looks ginormous as it rises from above the mountains of calm oceans or a prairie field, here's the NASA certified tip. Photographers can simulate the moon illusion by taking pictures of the moon low on the horizon using a long lens with buildings, mountains, or trees in the frame. There you go. If you want to get like a beautiful picture like this, that's the tip. That's what you need to do. Long lens and have some stuff, some tall stuff in the frame. Interesting. That's a yeah. good tip. I'm hoping to be able to get out to go see it somewhere that isn't in the middle of the city I live in. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I think, um, I think unfortunately for me, um, there's... There's just, around my house, there's a lot of pine trees. So hopefully it'll still be kind of pink once it gets above the pine tree line. But um, but I'll take a look. I'll take a look and see. And hopefully that's the case. Hopefully by the time it gets above there, it's not already all white. I'm so obsessed with all like the super moons and stuff. I always sit outside, but I end up living in downtown. So, mm. so you got a lot of light pollution where you are then. Yeah, it's not ideal. Yeah. Yeah, I don't really have too much of that here. Like, I mean, I'm in a neighborhood, so there's some light pollution, but there's not like a ridiculous amount like there is in a downtown area. Yeah. We can still see some stuff. We can definitely see super moons. They look awesome. Love that. I'll have I'll have to see I'll have to see how my um how my phone takes a picture of it because I got I have the iPhone whatever the newest one is the Max version so I've got the fancy camera so I'll be interested be interested to see if it can photograph the moon pretty well or yes. not. Let me know how that goes. For sure. Okay, so before we end today, I have a little announcement. So cast members already know this because I told y'all, but everybody doesn't know yet. We, um, well, I think I might have said it on a previous episode, but anyway, we're saying it again. Next week on Interstage Window, we are doing an Among Us episode. So be there. Bree, are you going to be there? Are you free next Saturday? Yes, I'm going to be there. Yes. Okay. So for, for those of you guys that don't know, when we play Among Us, we, um, we get as many of us into the voice chat as we can. We all play together. I'll share the code with my viewers, that sort of thing. And, uh, and we have a role play topic that we do. So the topic for this is going to be your first role play characters. I want to hear about that that crazy weird fandom OC. I want to be hear, hear about your cringy cat girl. I want to hear about your hooded figure in the corner of the tavern. Like that's what I want to hear about, right? That's what I want to hear about. I want to hear about your first fandom crush that you role played. All that stuff. All that stuff. So that's our Thanks. topic. <laughs> is that is that you? Which did I call you out in that last one? Yeah, the, the fandom crush. That was mine. Yes. <laughs> That's a very common first role play character, I feel like. Um, yes. So, yeah. So, so get in here. Come hang out with us. Um, anybody that's a regular viewer is is welcome. Um, and uh, and anybody that has a story to share, that's like your ticket to get into the to get into the VC. So show up same stream time noon to two. And this one's a little bit special because uh, we are basically having this as a little graduation party for Landon, um, the norm the co-host that we normally have on most of the streams. It was supposed to be me, me, Landon, and Bree today, but it didn't work out. Landon got busy, but anyways. Um, so we're gonna have a little party for her because the weekend after that, she is actually going to be graduating from her, um, her teaching program that she's doing. She's, uh, she's been going to get a degree in education so she can, um, change careers over to, uh, being a middle school teacher. And uh, so she's going to graduate weekend after next. So the weekend before that next weekend, we are going to be having a little party for her. And she loves Among Us, as y'all know. <laughs> Yes, so we're very excited for her. We're very excited for her. It's been a long road. Going to school again as an adult is a long road, no matter how you slice it, right? Yes. <laughs> All right. So that is our show for today. Thank you guys so much for coming and joining us. Um, Bree, uh, where can everybody find you? Or if there's something you'd like to promote, this is your time. Go for it. 
I guess y'all can follow me on TikTok. It's at that girl Brie J. Um, and on Twitter at Brie Bickle. Yes. Brie has some really fun TikToks on there. Her TikTok's really good and fun and exciting. Um, okay. TikTok. Yes. <laughs> I tried. I tried to be a TikToker. I kind of lost interest in it, but I still spend a stupid amount of time scrolling and watching TikToks. I'm not going to lie. <laughs> <laughs> It's very addicting. It is. <laughs> All right. So where you can find me, you can find me right here. We have our uh, our stream on Saturdays, which is about noon to two. That's our conversation stream where we go into a role play topic. I have my Thursday stream, which starts at 630. All these times are Eastern, by the way. All these times are Eastern. 630 to 830. That is my solo stream. That's a little bit more of like just hanging out, doing whatever I want. Like right now, we're playing a lot of Final Fantasy X. Uh, we're going to be on the Calm Lands next episode. So if you like Final Fantasy X, come watch. We're going to be traversing through the Calm Lands. And then um, I have my YouTube show, which is on my YouTube channel. That's called Spare Room. It goes up on Wednesdays, every Wednesday at 2 um, p.m. And again, all these times are Eastern. And uh, and that's it. That's all the main places you can find me. I also have a Twitter, but it's mostly promotion. But if I, every once in a while, I'll do hot takes. So if you like those, you're welcome to follow my Twitter. Here, I'll pop it in the into the thing the all right so there you go are so good yeah when i have them they're pretty they're kind of rare but but i do have them sometimes <laughs> <laughs> mostly i just promote myself and retweet stuff you know you know as as you do as you do on the twitters so that's it that's all the places you can find me um let's find someone to raid let's find somebody to raid let's see who's online let's see who's online all right, would y'all, do y'all want to watch, here's the choice. Do y'all want to watch Battlefield or Grand Theft Auto? Brie, what are you feeling more, Battlefield or Grand Theft Auto? What do you think? Battlefield, but I love those types of games. <laughs> you love those types of games? Okay, well, that's okay. You're the guest today, so um, so Battlefield it is. So we're going to raid a Moist Goat. I don't think we've actually raided him yet. He's wonderful. Um, a lovely, lovely streamer, part of the Wolves Den server that y'all know I'm a part of. Uh, he's great, really super supportive and awesome person so we're gonna we're gonna go raid him make sure you know i can't type so i gotta just double check did i did i spell his name right let's see there we go all right y'all have fun watching some battlefield i will see you guys on thursday and if i don't then i'll see you guys next saturday for among us because i know y'all are gonna be there all right don't forget to make it a great day everybody yeah. all right bye